Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, and Rodrigo Smith Zapata. Coming up on DTNS, Apple will let you pay with your eyes. Google keeps a product going instead of killing it. And do we even need headsets for the metaverse? Maybe we don't. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 14th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Man, I, I wish uh, I wish baseball had a California Ohio matchup going on. We, mm. We'd be representative of that uh, today. I got two Ohio, three California. Mm. Let's do this. All right, let's start with a few tech things you should know. The quick hits. After launching direct storage earlier this year, Microsoft is bringing GPU decompression to Windows PC games soon with the effort to improve game load times on PCs. The company says it's a popular request from game developers because it offloads what's needed to decompress assets in games onto the graphics card from the CPU. Yeah, seems like everybody wins with that one. Uh, some folks got their wish on this one as well. You won't be able to buy the $899 12 gigabyte RTX 480, 4080 card because enough people complained that it shouldn't be called the RTX 4080. Uh, the, the, the confusion is that the 16 gigabyte RTX 4080 has more VRAM, more cores, and more teraflops than the 12 gigabyte version. So just the 12 and the 16 are not the only difference. It's almost an entirely different card. People complained that this was confusing, so NVIDIA has shown them uh, it's given into the pressure and will sell the RTX 4080 16 gig for $1,199 November 16th on schedule, but it has pulled the less expensive 12 gigabyte RTX 4080 while it rebrands. Uh, that means it's got to choose a new name, change the inventory system, System, change the box names, lettering, all kinds of little fiddly stuff that seems easy to change until you're the one that has to manage all the changes. NVIDIA has not announced when the newly named card will go on sale. Mulvad VPN reports that the Android operating system is leaking traffic every time the device connects to a Wi-Fi network, even if the block connections without VPN, aka always on VPN, feature is on. This includes source IP addresses, DNS lookups, HTTPS traffic, and likely also NTP traffic. Mulvad discovered the issue during a security audit that is not yet published, but issued a warning on Thursday. Yeah, this is one of those things that's not really going to affect most of people. But if, you, if you're if you a subject of advanced persistent yeah, threats, you, you shouldn't be using it. this for your VPN anyway. You, you should be using something else. That's good to know. Uh, CNN reports that SpaceX told the Department of Defense in the United States uh, in a letter dated September 8th that it may no longer be able to provide Starlink terminals to help Ukraine's war effort with Russia by providing connectivity and asked the Pentagon to pay for more terminals. Earlier this month, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk claimed that there are around 25,000 Starlink terminals in Ukraine. Uh, uh, but responding to the CNN report tweeted, SpaceX is not asking to recoup past expenses, but cannot fund the existing system indefinitely and send several thousand more terminals that have data usage up to 100 times greater than typical households. <sighs> so saying, basically saying, like, we paid for it up till now, but we can't pay for it forever. Somebody else got to figure it out. Google began rolling out a change in how it marks ads in search. It will now show a sponsored label in bold next to search ads, with the label appearing above the site URL rather than in the same line. This will roll up first to mobile, with Google saying it will start testing on desktops sometime in the future. All right. Uh, that is the quick hits. Let's talk a little more about Apple's mixed reality set. The information sources say it will feature iris scanning. Uh, that is not the flower. That is the part of your eye uh, that's in the middle. Uh, it'll work similar to what Face ID does on Apple iOS. Uh, it would let a user do things like authenticate payments. You could pay with your eyes. Uh, in, in the headset, and it could automatically switch users based on who's wearing it. You put it on, it sees what iris is there, and it switches the account. Uh, same sensors that track eyes for foveated rendering could be used for this iris scanning. Foveated rendering is that thing where the headset only renders the image in high res 
for the part of the screen you're looking at. Uh, it saves a little processing. And Gadget reminds us that Apple bought eye-tracking glasses maker Sensomotorix in 2017, and that Ming-Chi Kuo said this year that Apple is buying Premax's iris detection modules. So those two together kind of make sense that they would do some iris tracking, right? Yeah, the information sources also said that the Apple headset would be made of mesh fabric, aluminum, and glass, and would let you attach prescription lenses magnetically to the inside of the headset. Not exactly sure how that's going to work, but cool if it does. An Apple mixed reality headset is expected to launch sometime next year. And rumored to cost between two and three thousand U.S. dollars. Let's let Rob get back up off the floor from hearing that number. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so when I thought the the Facebook joint was uh, kind of expensive, it's half the price of what this thing is. I fully expect that Apple is going to do what Apple does. This thing will be beautiful. It will, you know, it'll it'll work great. Um, but man, it's is it for regular people? Um, are regular people going to go out and spend three grand on a headset? Well, you know, I mean, it, I totally agree with you, Rob. Like a sticker shock for sure. But I also feel like this is what Apple does best. They make a thing and people go, what? That's insanely expensive. I will buy it. I would never pay that much for a phone slash laptop slash tablet slash watch. Anything. Slash, <laughs> right. You know, uh, and, and what happens is I don't know how you define regular people, but people who are fans of Apple buy the thing in large numbers. Mm -hmm. The next version is maybe not as expensive or they come out with a less expensive version of it. And, and so, so the song remains the same. Uh, I mean, we don't know what it's going to cost. This, this, this might not be right. This is, this is just what people are expecting, but, but usually these things do end up in the ballpark. So I expect it's going to be more expensive. And you see Mark Zuckerberg out there saying our, our thing is less expensive than the unannounced thing from Apple that they haven't given a price to because of these rumors. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I am a, uh, I am a VR enthusiast. I, I very much like my Quest 2, uh, you know, uh, and the Quest before it, uh, where, you know, the, yes, they've raised the prices for, for the Quest, but we're still in the sub $500 range. Anything like two to $3,000 is like, what in the heck is this thing going to do? But you know what? Maybe it will do things that um, have kept a lot of people to be like not really all that into VR until now. Yeah, like I said, I, I I am not into VR like you are, but if anyone can pull it off, you know, we, we know that uh, Apple creates wonderful hardware. So I expect this to be wonderful. A surprise but like, and delight us. I was shocked. I was like, ooh, yeah. that's, that's a couple car notes. <laughs> oh, aluminum mesh fabric and glass. I can already picture the sleek design. It's going to let you pay with your eyes. That's going to be an amazing demo. And by, by the time they have finished dazzling you with all that, a bunch of people will be trying to pay with their eyes the $2,000 to $3,000 uh, that they need for this. Um, <laughs> Master I, says, I also, my wallet is up here, buddy. Talking, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I also, you know, there, there have been a few folks I've seen, you know, online just being like, oh, now we're scanning eyes. You know, this is, this is uh, you know, some sort of, uh, scary movie uh, in the making, and it's not unlike Face ID. Yeah, yeah. Right? I don't. I, it, this guy, you have to put this thing on your head. You have to authorize it. Face ID is very uh, well vetted at this point uh, at being uh, fairly secure. I I don't get the sense that this is anything than fear mongering. If you're upset about the eye tracking, uh, it's it, it, okay. we'll have to wait and see the details, of course. But it it seems pretty easy to make this pretty harmless. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, you can dunk on Apple if you want, but it's more fun to dunk on Google sometimes. We get it. Stadia, Reader, Wave, almost Aww, every messaging wave. app they've ever made. <laughs> um, there's a whole site devoted to documenting what Google has killed. It's called killedbygoogle.com. So let's take a moment to appreciate that Google seems to have turned its destructive gaze away from one of its products. <gasps> Technically... Google Fiber is part of Alphabet's access company, not Google. And maybe that's the key. It's not actually Google. So it may, <laughs> it may not suffer the internal incentive system that rewards Google engineers for launching products, but not for keeping them going. 
Whatever the reason, Google Fiber has bounced back from its near-death experience in 2016 when it laid off 9% of its staff, paused fiber rollouts, and indicated it would switch from fiber to wireless. Indeed. Instead, fiber is rolling out once again. Google Fiber announced it will offer 5 gig gigabits per second and also 8 gigabit per second symmetrical wow. service for $125 and $150 a month, respectively. You'll be able to get it if you're an existing customer in the state of Utah, also Kansas City, West Des Moines, as early as next month, with other existing markets getting it in early 2023. Uh, it's not cheap, but eight gigabits per second. I oh, mean, goodness. it's yeah. not unlike what I'm paying for <laughs> right? service that is yeah. not that fast. Now, this means that the expansion plans that Google Fiber announced in August might actually be real. Uh, West Des Moines was... Uh, the first new state, uh, West Des Moines being in Iowa, made Iowa the first new state for Google Fiber, Fiber service in five years. And they're going right into the five and eight gigabit per second uh, bucket. Google Fiber is also talking to communities in Arizona, Colorado, Nebraska, Nevada, and Idaho as well. Those states will be the focus for growth as well as expanding in the existing metro areas that it's already in. Now, the company wrote on its blog in August, we'd also love to talk to communities that want to build their own fiber networks. Apparently, that's how West Des Moines got going. So they're willing to help communities start community fiber, and then they would have an easier way to come in and start offering service on that fiber. Uh, Rob, can we celebrate a thing with Google in its name sticking around? Is that even possible? Some people will, Tom, but uh, I, I got trust issues when it comes to, <laughs> to, to, to me and Google and stuff that they release that are not email, search, Android, and uh, Google Docs. That's, that's, that's all that I know that they will actually you know, keep going on pretty much forever. Um, for me, the, you know, I kind of, I kind of feel like a Charlie Brown, uh, you know, trying to kick the, you know, the football from Lucy. They just keep <laughs> pulling it out from under me every single time. So, I'm happy for the folks who can get this, but like I said, me, me and Google, we got we got trust issues. They, you know, yeah. I just, just want to see them keep something. I don't, I don't want to talk about it because I don't know. People <laughs> have told me that me talking about it is the reason the stuff gets canceled. So I'll just try to stay silent on the whether curse or not of Rob. Or not. <laughs> I mean, if there's if there's anything that okay, so Google likes to start lots of things, not necessarily finish them, but something like what we're talking about as far as. Uh, what is being promised, uh, Google Fiber wise, people will pay for that. And mm -hmm. why would Google yank that? You know, it's like it's 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 sort of you you have a home run here. It's not you know like a Google saying, well, we're gonna well, get a little crazy and you know see see what sticks. People want fast internet. That's what they want. Yeah. Yes. And. It's expensive and not terribly profitable to roll out, which is why all the other telcos stopped rolling out fiber as well, uh, because the difficulty of getting the permitting, running the cables, in especially in metro areas, was just yeah. too much. And so when when in 2016, I'm like, that's it. Google fi Google's getting out of this business. It is it is just not worth it. When the telcos are not, <laughs> it's their business, and the telcos don't want to run fiber. How is Google going to make a go of it? It seems like they figured it out, which is go to areas that are easier to roll out in, more, more rural areas, mm -hmm, it seems mm -hmm. like. Uh, and Get the word out that get, it works. And try to develop community fiber so that it makes it easier so you don't have to do all the work. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that they got back into this. So, so here's what I, when I started looking at and researching this story, what, what Google is doing is kind of like what they're doing with RCS. They, you know, the, the carriers just didn't roll that stuff out so google mm, had to mm -hmm. do this you know if we want this to be a thing we need to make it a thing and i think they're kind of doing that with fibers like you know what the, you know the, the, the telcos are not doing this so if we want it to be a thing we need to make it a thing um will google you know you know will this be available in every city everywhere i don't think that that's google's plan i think as you said tom they want to get this rolled out where it is easy to roll it out and then when you have places like you know uh, like iowa that has this level of access and you have you know states right next to it that hey how come i can't get access like that mm -hmm. that's going to put pressure on the telecom companies and then maybe they will have to kind of fo follow google's lead yeah, I, 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 it's confusing because it's called Google Fiber, but this isn't part of Google. Uh, it's part of Alphabet, which owns Google, in a different company called Access. And I think that's the key for the fact that it didn't get killed. 
because it doesn't need to use search to monetize it. They figured out like, oh, we can make a business out of it. Like, like Sarah was saying, it's like, it's not easy, but since we don't have any other part of the company making us money, we didn't go, well, but it's, it's hard. So let's not do it. They're like, this is our only business. If we want to stay a part of alphabet, we have to figure out how to make it work. And it sounds like maybe they have. Hmm. I mean, if enough people pay, it's worth it. It's also spooky season. Woo! And Dan Campos down in Mexico City, down from where we are anyway, has an update on how you can join in on the festivities where he is, no matter where in the world you are. Hello, friends of DTNS. Here I come with some Noticias de Tecnología Express. Do you want to join the Dia de los Muertos Parade but you are not in Mexico City? Fear not. The city's Ministry of Culture announced that the parade will be present on the Metaverse thanks to a collaboration with Spatial and the Central Land Platforms and a three-dimensional environment created by SL Life. There will be an international avatar party where participants can design their own characters to participate and join the parade recreated by XL Life within the platforms. You will be able to catch the event through your cell phone, tablet, computer, or even in more traditional media such as social networks or local TV. The Dia de los Muertos Pared is an ancestral Mexican tradition that was established in 2015, thanks to the arrival of James Bond. After the release of Spectre, the props from the movie were used for the first time in this kind of event. This year's parade will take place on October 29th. Back to you, amigos. That's funny, Dan. And and I love that Decentraland <laughs> is part of that. I believe Snoop Dogg owns some real estate in Decentraland. So maybe you can go hang at his place. After, after Can't wait. Parade. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you're feeling social, talk to us on the social networks. You can get in touch with the DTNS folks on DTNS Show on Twitter at DTNS Show uh, or on Instagram, DTNS Picks, DTNS P I X. So at Connect This Week, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg made a big deal about the fact that avatars and Horizon Worlds would get legs next, next year, like <laughs> actual legs. He even demonstrated what the legs would look like. Sort of. Upload VR's Ian Hamilton was the first to pass along Meta's statement that, quote, to enable the preview of what's to come, the segment featured animations created from motion capture, end quote. So... Legs are apparently coming, but that video was not really a sneak peek at that specific technology. All in all, the media reaction to Connect was not very good. IGN even titled a piece by Logan Plant called The Metaverse Has Had a Very Bad Week. <laughs> yeah, there was like leaks of, of people inside Meta saying like, we don't like Horizon Worlds and a, and a memo saying we all have to use it or it's not going to get better. Uh, that led Stephen Levy to ask on Wired.com, what if the Metaverse is better without virtual reality? Uh, Levy was pointing out that in Meta's announcement, they said they would bring Horizon Worlds to the web they talked about working to integrate 2D participants into things like Horizon Worlds 3D VR meetings. Uh, there's integration with Zoom coming, integration with Teams coming. The pitch was a good one. Make VR spaces accessible for everyone until headsets become widespread. Seemed smart. Levy points out that other VR companies like Mesmerize and Spatial have also made the decision to allow 2D participation. And in fact, Spatial says about 80% of its customers are on the web or mobile now, not on a Quest headset. Levy wonders, quote, could it be that the metaverse doesn't require VR after all? So I'll, I'll point out The Sims and Second Life brought 3D worlds to a 2D screen uh, and had varying levels of success over the years. And until Apple or somebody else popularizes a VR interface that everybody wants to wear and pay for, 2D is necessary if you want to gain any kind of scale. Is Levy right? Can, can we have some kind of 3D avatar-filled metaverse-like space and have it succeed without even needing a VR headset? I think we have to. Or it dies. Because yeah. we talked about it just a few minutes ago. Not everybody is going to be into the, the VR thing. It's, it's cool. Like, you either are or you aren't. Maybe, maybe you will be later, and you just aren't yet. But, uh, but yeah, I think, 
I think the idea of this metaverse being some virtual reality thing is is putting so many people off before they even really know what it means. And let's be honest, none of us really know what the metaverse means yet because we're just talking about it rather than living in it. But I don't know, Rob, what are your thoughts? So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you because I think that when you, you know, for, for this thing to take off, you have to have critical mass. And you're never going to get critical mass. You, you're just not going to get enough people using it if it costs 500 to 1500 to potentially $3,000 to get a peripheral. Because you, you're talking about spending that kind of money. People spend less on phones. They spend way, you know, less on computers. They can do a lot more than what these headsets can do. Um, so if you can actually make these virtual worlds to where you can participate and you can play and you can actually, you know, you know, be a member of a community without having to go buy a really expensive peripheral to allow you to be a part of that community, what you may see is that people get into it and then down the road, they're way more open to spending that 500 to 1500 to $3,000 on a device so that they can actually do it in 3d. Yeah. And possibly the price of those devices comes down, you know, in, in the meantime, right. There could be, you know, more people want to decide, like, I don't want to Levy calls them second class citizens. If you're a 2d in a, in a 3d space, maybe more people are like, I don't want to do that. Maybe I should buy it by the headset headsets start to get cheaper. They meet in the middle. And then suddenly the, there's, there's something that everybody's doing that that's a potential scenario that could play out. My, my thing is it, it, going back to what Sarah said, what we kind of all know what the metaverse sort of wants to be like a virtual world where we have an avatar that can wander around and do stuff right but what is it good for what is the thing that that people are going to say yeah i want to do it even if it's 2d right that that's yeah. the question right is, or, is or it have even to if it's for work yeah if it's not immersive is it beneficial for me to go into the metaverse and use an avatar to do a meeting even in 2d versus just being on zoom like, it, otherwise, people are just going to be on Zoom. They're not going to go the extra mile to do this. Yeah, that is, that's kind of the unanswered question is, how does this make my meeting better? Let's just, you know, let, let fun aside, let's say that this is something that you, you know, it, it is part of your workplace and you're supposed to connect with your coworkers better. How exactly is that happening? And I, I, I don't, I think a lot of us are kind of even, I mean, even me, VR enthusiast for sure. You know, I, I kind of shrug and say, I don't know how it makes it better. And I, I'm not well, the sure. Way, the way the, the answer is it, it brings presence. It brings a sense of being in the room with somebody in a way that a three, a, a flat zoom call doesn't. And you can do stuff with 3d on a 2d screen that provides a little bit of that. Is sure. Enough, though? Yeah, I mean, I can see situations where you go, oh, this is really cool. But so many more where you say, this is, I mean, somewhat cartoonish. Mm -hmm. Really cool can be considered a gimmick. Is it useful? Does it help you get work done better? I think that when they can figure that part out, that's when it'll start to take off. Yeah. It, or, or there's something else that none of the none of us have thought of uh, that some developer totally. is going to hit on, and everybody's going to go, "Oh yeah, no, that's fun." Even, even, even on my monitor, that's fun. It would be even better with a headset. Uh, that that's that's what's happened with every platform out there. Uh, it was news groups, it was email, it was the web. Uh, you know, there's there's something that happens that everybody goes, "Oh yeah, no, this is this is worth doing. This is worth getting the PC for. This is worth getting the smartphone for." We just it's call it the killer app or the killer platform or whatever. Uh, they, that thing for the metaverse, for virtual spaces, whatever you want to call it, uh, we're, we're waiting to find out what it is. If it is. Well, some of us are also waiting for autonomous vehicles to take oh, yeah. over the world. You know, it's slow going, but we're, we're on the path. It is normal if you're a pedestrian crossing the street, you make eye contact with a driver who might be coming towards you. Make sure that they see you and they know you're crossing so they're not going to hit you. But autonomous cars don't have eyes like human eyes. They don't have eyes at all. But maybe they should. Scientists from the University of Tokyo and Kyoto University put an oversized pair of manually controlled animated eyes on the front of a golf cart with a human 
but otherwise non-visible driver. So nobody could see the driver. They just knew that a golf cart was coming towards them. They recorded four scenarios. The first, two with the cart, with the eyes, and two without. Nine women and nine men used a virtual reality headset to play through various scenarios and had three seconds to decide if they were going to attempt to cross the street in front of the approaching golf cart that might not be seeing them. Participants said when the vehicle had eyes that were looking away, the crossing didn't feel as safe. When the eyes appeared to be paying attention to them, the crossing felt safer. So googly eyes. Put googly eyes on autonomous cars. That's right. And we all win. I mean, you know, ha ha, but like that but that's makes what, that's, perfect sense. That's the science. Like literally, that's the science. You just have to be able to control the googly eye, right? So that so that it's actually yeah. looking at you when the sensors know you're there so that it's meaningful, right? Otherwise, yeah. it's luring you into a false sense of security. I was sort of thinking about like, okay, how like silly is this? You know, the googly eyes kind of thing. Like if a car looks like it's looking at me, like we're good. There could be other ways that the car could let me know that it's looking at me. You know, maybe it blinks green three times or, you know, there, there, there are other ways to do this, but this is the right call because yeah, if somebody's not behind the wheel and you can't make eye contact, you want to make sure that the car knows where you are. Yeah. I just like the googly eyes. I mean, know, yeah, the, right. You know, um, <laughs> the you know the the self autom or the automated driving is cool. Can you put that on a golf cart? I don't golf often, but I would golf more if I could get a golf cart with googly eyes on the front. Those things are kind of cool to me. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's like oh. a cool golf cart. And imagine where else we can go, like customized kinds of eyes for your car. You know, you could you could have like like bloodshot oh. eyes or or you know like like those decorative contact lenses. You could have cat's eyes on your. I car. I mean, almost the yeah. way that many vehicles i mean there are a variety of ways that you can you know blink to turn left they don't all look the same mm -hmm. but you know that they're that they have one purpose and yeah. that's to let you know what's up googly eyes may not end up being the thing but a notification system is a is i'm glad they're thinking about stuff like that yeah this is this is really interesting and and, and peer-reviewed research that says yeah if you if you think the car can see you uh, by whether it's googly eyes or something else that you feel safer. Uh, and you probably are because that way, you know, that the car is sensing you as long as the system works. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Mark. This is in response to a conversation earlier in the week. Mark says, it seems to me that Zuckerberg talking about Mark Zuckerberg is conflating PC and windows as exemplified by his comparison of Mac and windows, not Mac and PC. The openness of the PC is what allows for different hardware, etc. Getting it to work with Windows is always challenging. Yeah, that, that's a good point. P uh, people pick on this all the time, and people, I think, casually can use PC and Windows interchangeably, but it's an important distinction in, in the distinction that Zuckerberg is making, right? The, the PC platform is more open than the Windows platform. Uh, the PC platform isn't entirely open. It's, you know, under the Intel thumb, uh, but but it is more open than Windows. So that's, uh, that's a fair point. And then Scott uh, wrote in and said, I agree with Tom on this one. Microsoft is making a huge mistake mistake ditching the brand recognition for office i don't think it's a huge mistake but uh, okay you're agreeing with me i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fight you uh however i don't find myself caring all too much says scott as many years ago i switched to open office and now libra office and haven't looked back i've also moved a significant percentage of my clients to libra office which they have been using without issue and they certainly love the price so yeah. there you go another yeah. le satisfied libra office fan uh, no kidding. Well, thanks to everybody who who sends us emails. Do keep that feedback coming. It always helps make our show better. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your thoughts. For now, we would like to thank Len Peralta for drawing the tech stories. And Len, what do you have for us today? Well, first off, uh, I'm googly eyes on my car. I'm taking my car in for service. I'm asking for googly eyes. That I'm, I'm need to have. Those. I think you should. Yeah, I'm, I th I'm liking it. Yeah. So, um, big bad week for uh, for Meta. Um, and I think, <laughs> do we need headsets? Well, maybe we do need headsets, but why don't we just go with this whole legs thing? And that's what this is. Just <laughs> Meta, just give people legs. 
I think that's terrific, man. You get you but, with a headset. You've, you've drawn someone with a headset holding legs. Yeah, not their you own get the, legs. You get the legs with the headset, right? Oh. You know, these pl like plastic legs or something. I don't know. It'd be kind of weird. <laughs> I think it'd be a selling point, maybe. I, don't I was know. worried that that was the leg bone sticking up out of the leg. <laughs> well, it might be because it is near Halloween. No, mm. pa package the googly eyes with the legs. I think you got something going on there. Anyway, uh, this image is available right now on my online store. It's lenperaltastore.com. Or if you're a Patreon subscriber, go to uh, patreon.com forward slash len. This is yours for the taking right now just for, uh, just for backing me at Patreon. So go ahead and do that. Well, good stuff as always, Len. Also good Thank stuff you. from Rob Dunwood hanging with us today. Rob, let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. As always, it is a pleasure being on DTNS, and folks can get with me everywhere at Rob Dunwood, and also check out a couple of my other shows, the SMR Podcast and the Tech John. Mm. See the Please. shirt here. Always a good supplement yeah. uh, to, if you in your DTNS diet. You get a Excellent little extra. subscriptions. Take it from us. Um, also, a special thanks to Eric Pfeiffer. Eric is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. And you know what, Eric? We want to thank you for all the years of support. You, the best. You enrich in our lives. And you can't spell enriching without Eric. That's right. Yeah, somehow. <laughs> uh, speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show. Good day, Internet GDI rolls in right after DTNS wraps up. But just a reminder, you can catch this show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. I will be out next week, but the team will be back on Monday talking about the impact of social media on animal conservation efforts with Blair Bazdarish and Jen Cutter as well. This week's episode of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reed. Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Lamar Wilson, Rob Dunwood, and Chris Christensen. Our guest this week was Annalie Newitz. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>